This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by Titan Auto and Tire. Titan has some of the very few independent auto repair shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids, and from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. Coming up this week, Lamborghini announces their first EV. CATL has a new LFP battery with some seriously impressive specs. Used Teslas are at rock bottom prices and more. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 164 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. I hope you've all been enjoying all the interviews I've been publishing recently. I've gotten some positive feedback from a few of you, and to be honest, I find that I'm really enjoying these more than covering the news. That being said, this episode is all about catching up with the latest EV news, and this week is just as exciting as many others with EVs setting new records and a brand announcing their first EV, and we'll start with that story. Lamborghini has announced that they will be adding a fourth vehicle to their lineup, a high ground clearance GT with a 2 plus 2 seating configuration, and it will be all electric. While details on performance were absent from the press release, there was one line that caught my attention. They said, quote, The Lanzador is an all-wheel drive concept that includes an electric motor on each axle, ensuring permanent all-electric drive in every condition, surface, and driving style. And here's the part that I picked up on with peak power of more than one megawatt, end quote. Now, for those of you who don't do quick calculations in your head, one megawatt of power is equal to 1,341 horsepower. So they're saying more than 1,341 horsepower. Now, while we don't know specifics about the performance, it is likely that this is going to be going head-to-head with the Tesla Model S Plaid, Lucid Air, and others. But surprisingly... That bit isn't what I found to be the most interesting about this vehicle. It's actually the design of the uh, car itself. It's a departure from almost every Lambo model I have ever seen, except for maybe the Urus SUV, in that it sits so high off the ground. And when I think about Lamborghini, I have to admit that this it, the image of what I'm looking at on the screen, the pictures, and you'll have to Google the pictures, I, this isn't the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about Lamborghini. However, their sleek two-door design with flared wide-body wheel arches and angular bodywork does make sure that even when you're looking at this one, it's clear that it is a Lamborghini. But I honestly can't figure out exactly the why, the reasoning behind the design. And my best guess is actually resulting from a quote from Stefan Winkelmann saying, quote, with Lanzador, we are looking into our future without forgetting our DNA. The first coupes from Lamborghini with their front engines were sporty, elegant Gran Turismo suitable for everyday use as a two plus two seater. The concept for our fourth production model leverages our philosophy of super sportiness combined with brave new technologies and fearless design, end quote. And he also said that, quote, the fourth model is the absolutely logical extension of the existing portfolio, the perfect link between Urus and our super sports cars, end quote. And sure, I can see that definitively. But why wouldn't the brand make their first EV either a low slung hypercar or an SUV? And maybe they couldn't make up their minds and decided to go with a mix of both. Either way, I think it is a bold move, certainly one that screams Lamborghini. Next, a European EV has removed the Tesla Model S Plaid again from holding the record spot for the fastest production EV around the Nürburgring, but this time it was not the Porsche Taycan clawing its spot back. No, this time it wasn't even a German EV. It was Croatian, and honestly inevitable if you ask me. Since the Concept 2 from Remats was unveiled, I have always expected that should the car make it to production, that it would be running around the ring before long. And while it didn't happen as soon as I would have hoped, it has happened now and in quite a spectacular way. Now, the Model S Plaid dethroned the Taycan with a time of 7 minutes and 25 seconds to claim the top spot fairly recently, but now they have to take a back seat to the Remax Vera, which has absolutely crushed the Model S time with a 7 minute, 
5.298 second run. That is incredible and beats the Tesla by 20 seconds. The pilot of the vehicle, racing driver Martin Kodrick, said that the Rimats is devastatingly fast on the track. So the brother to the king of quick, the Pininfarina Batista, has come to the ring to show that it too can earn a catchy title from me and hereby is officially dubbed the Titan of the Track. And I'm having a lot of fun with these titles, by the way. <laughs> and if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I actually wrote an article about the Pininfarina Batista back in February where I did call it the king of quick because it does the 0 to 60 in 1.79 seconds, which is 0 0.06 quicker than the Navara. And honestly, it's not surprising that it would be close because they are based on the same platform and use the same electric motors. Oh, and the Navara could have probably gone faster in its record lap, but it was limited to a top speed of 220 miles an hour because of the tires. The Navara has a top speed of 258 miles an hour normally. Okay, let's shift away from car models for a minute and talk about batteries. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the terms volts, amps, or even watts. Battery stored energy or energy consumption is measured in kilowatt hours, and power is measured in kilowatts. But one measurement that I haven't really talked about often, and honestly, I don't remember actually ever explaining, is the C rate of a battery. The C rate of a battery is a measurement of the rate at which a battery can be charged or discharged relative to its maximum capacity. A battery with a 1C rating means that to charge or discharge the battery will take an hour, and a battery with a 2C rate means it would take 30 minutes. The way you calculate this is by dividing an hour by the number portion of the C rating. So. As an example, if you have a battery with a capacity of 2300 milliamp hours or 2.3 amp hours, if it had a 2C rating, it would take 30 minutes to discharge it completely at a rate of 4.6 amps because you would multiply the 2.3 amp hours by the 2 in the C rating to see its max current and then divide the hour by 2, as I previously mentioned. So I hope that makes sense. It's definitely something that takes a little time to kind of wrap your head around, or at least it did for me. But why is this important? Well, the ability of a battery to charge and discharge quickly is important because people want high powered vehicles that have massively quick acceleration times, which means discharging batteries really quickly and at high amperage. And then on the other side, we also want vehicles that can charge really, really quickly. One of the quickest charging EVs on the road these days is the Hyundai Ioniq 5. It has a calculated C rate, at least from what I could find, of somewhere between 2.3 C and 2.85 C. So just keep that in mind as an example for this next story about a breakthrough from battery manufacturer CATL. This past week on August 16th, CATL launched Shenjing, the world's first 4C super fast charging LFP, lithium iron phosphate battery. Now, before I get to this battery, I want to point out that the naming Shen, meaning God or divine in Mandarin, and Xing, meaning walk or movement. So they're naming this battery divine movement, which when you think about what it's capable of doing, that's a really appropriate name for a battery with a 4C rating. And CITL says that they expect it will open up an era of super fast charging for EVs. At room temperature, they say that Shenqing can charge to 80% state of charge in 10 minutes. Meanwhile, CATL leverages cell temperature control technology on system platforms to ensure that the cells heat up to the optimal operating temperature rapidly, which can also allow a 0 to 80% charge in just 30 minutes, which yes, I know is longer, but in a temperature as low as negative 10 degrees Celsius, negative 10 degrees Celsius. I honestly don't know of other batteries that are capable of doing that. And maybe I'm reading it wrong. The press release. I don't know. But that honestly is more impressive to me that it can charge really quickly in low temperatures than just 10 minutes, zero to 80% in room temperature. Now, along with all battery announcements, it is important to recognize that technologies like this can show very impressive results in labs, 
but often don't make their way to production. However, CATL says they're mass producing this cell by the end of this year and will be equipping vehicles with these cells in the first quarter of next year. So if that's the case, this will be a massive change in the marketplace. But what EV companies use CATL cells? Oh, that's right, Tesla. So if the press release is to be trusted, then will we see Tesla vehicles as early as next year using these batteries? And if so, that would mean that they are going to charge and discharge more quickly than anything else out there in the marketplace, giving Tesla a another really significant advantage over the competition. Okay, next, you may know Roman from the Fast Lane YouTube channel. Well, he shared a rather scary and frustrating experience that he had this week in a Facebook video about getting stranded in a GMC Hummer EV and the rather extensive process to get the vehicle moving again. And while this wouldn't normally be something that I would cover as far as the news goes, as vehicles get more and more complex and software and computer centric, it's important to highlight the things that possibly need to be done if you do end up having a problem. So I've pulled the audio from that clip, I've condensed it and kind of taken out some of the things that were just dead air or empty space uh, and condensed it so that it's a lot easier to understand. But take a listen to the experience that he was having with this truck. I'm pretty pissed off right now and I'm pretty nervous about, you know, the traffic that this truck has left me. Very dangerous location. And I've got Tommy coming with uh, the lightning to try to tow me out of here, but if it's in park, it won't. And then, of course, I called OnStar. Uh, they booted me through like 14 different people, kept asking for my phone number. Uh, they said I needed premium service. And finally, they said the soonest they can get a tow truck here is in an hour. Uh, and, you know, if it wasn't for the police officer behind me, I'd be in a very precarious location. And, you know, the wiper stopped working. How nice is that? supposed to be this little tiny cable pole deep, deep, deep underneath the dashboard. And if you yank on that hard enough, apparently you can open up the front trunk. So that's what we did. Okay, you open it? There we go. So we could pull the battery, wherever that is, and see if we can reset the system that way. Do you know where the battery is? Yeah, it should be under here. Under there? Yeah. Let's let's pull the battery. All right, well, we killed it. I mean, everything's killed. Let's give it like 20 seconds. Yeah, maybe it'll reset itself. All right, try it. I think it's working. Is, is it going into gear? Look on the thing. Yeah, I think you're... I know. Shifter is locked. Press brake for 20 seconds. Okay. Open and close driver window. It's making us it's making us do some weird stuff. Hold on. <laughs> Open and then close passenger window. What in the heck is it doing? Can you close the door? Open and close <laughs> left rear window. Can you shoot that? Can yeah. Shoot that? It says shifter is locked. Okay. Open and close right rear window. How about you just give me a cable to put it in neutral? Open hood. Dismiss. Open and close passenger window. Not yet. What is this doing? Press brake for 20 seconds. Oh, wait. Hold on. Maybe it worked. What do you mean? Well, nothing happened. Oh, nothing happened yet? And nine. These are eight. Shifter unlocked! Neutral! Oh, <laughs> How about drive? Okay, wait. Wait. You guys might have to sit in there until I pull it up because if you open the doors, it might throw it in back in the park. Well, quick, we'll, go into, we'll go into drive. Should we try? try it. Let's try. Drive. Uh -huh. Yeah, we got drive. Huh? Got reverse. We got reverse. <laughs> well, uh... well let, let's pull it out of, out of here. That was the craziest thing with the windows. So basically what happened is that they had an issue. The car just stopped right dead in the middle of a turning lane. Traffic was backing up behind him. They had to disconnect the 12 volt battery to completely shut the car down, reset the computers. And then when it came back on, they had to communicate with the car in a series of human inputs that are programmed into the software of the computer that allow the car to know that it's being reset. Super complicated. These guys are EV guys. They are very smart. They have a lot of experience with EVs. 
And you can tell that even they were very frustrated and uh, in ways confused about why they're getting these instructions. So how can we expect, quote unquote, normal people, you know, the people that are, are now entering into the adoption phase, the early majority, how can we possibly expect that they are going to deal with situations like this should they happen? And it's not that that's a regular occurrence, but as this is clearly evidence, it does happen. Are we going to expect people to just call AAA and have the car towed to the dealership? And then who knows how much they would have to pay to get the dealers to go through all of this? I, I, I don't know. I don't think there's a good answer to this, but I wanted to bring it to your attention to highlight that you know, cars are being more complex and we might have to change the way we approach potential situations that could occur when we're out and about. OK, now to the last three stories. Honda this week had announced that they are also going to adopt Tesla's connector, the NACS connector. And well, that's funny because Honda doesn't sell any EVs here in North America anymore. But it makes sense because the ones that they are going to be selling in North America are actually both going to be using GM's Ultium platform, the Honda Prologue and the Acura ZDX. So this announcement from the executive vice president of Honda Motor Company is actually kind of empty in substance, but I don't think he could have said it any better. He said, quote, we clearly depend on GM. Once they switched to NACS, we will follow with the ZDX as well, end quote. Basically, he said along the lines of, oh, uh, our platform suppliers already announced. So I guess, um, hey, we're adopting NACS, too. Yay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm in a mood today. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> All right. Well, I've had enough fun at their expense uh, for now. <laughs> and on to a follow up on uh, the NACS being required for DC fast charging installs in Texas. Now, um, and I haven't looked it up, so I don't know what episode it was, but I did mention that Texas was throwing around the idea of requiring NACS to be a connector on any DC fast charging sites in order to qualify for federal funding. They would have to have both CCS and NACS connectors on them. And well, it's passed. Texas approved the requirement this past Wednesday. So that means Every single DC fast charging site in the state in order to qualify for funding will have to have both connectors. This is fantastic news because naturally that's going to make sure that they are future proof because the industry is headed in that direction, even Honda. And damn it, I wasn't going to do that again. Sorry. Um, but there is a big problem, something that in reality might not really be something that you would worry about. But when it comes to standards... And they are trying to get the NACS to be an actual standard that is used here in North America. When it comes to standards, you want to absolutely make sure that it is safe and therefore has its UL certification. And for those who don't know, UL or Underwriter Laboratories is one of the oldest safety certification companies out there. They certify products based on industry-wide safety standards. And I'm sure that Tesla has done everything to make sure that their cables and their connectors are as safe as possible. But if NACS is going to be a true standard, then any company should be able to make the cables and connectors, not just Tesla. And honestly, if it's not UL certified, how do we know that they're making it safe enough? So without having the UL certification, mm, no, I'm just not going to go there. All right. So this last news story for you this week is also about Tesla. As I had said, there has never been a better time to buy a used Model 3. Many Model 3s can even be found below $25,000. Now, why is that $25,000 number important? Well, because according to the used EV tax credit, only EVs that are older than two years old below $25,000 are going to qualify for that $4,000 tax credit for the used vehicles. So if you've been looking for a used Tesla, go get one, but make sure that you buy from a dealership and not a person because one of the rules for the used EV tax credit is that the vehicle must be purchased through a dealership. 
So I've mentioned three. It's got to be older than two years, purchased from a dealership, and be priced below $25,000. There are other rules, and I covered those back in episode 135 at the beginning of the year for my EV tax credit deep dive. But all of that aside, the fact that you can now go out there and get, let's say it is a $24,000 Tesla and apply a $4,000 tax credit, assuming that the vehicle qualifies and you yourself also have a tax burden and would qualify for that to take advantage of it. Now you're talking about a $20,000 Tesla Model 3. That is absolutely spectacular. That makes a used Model 3 basically price parity with any comparable gas car, even some that are not even considered premium or in that uh, more of a, a step up in market. That is just fantastic. And honestly, I know I'm holding out for the Aptera to be, I guess at this point, it'll probably be 2025. And I bought this Scion XB gas powered car to hold me over. But the thought of a Model 3 for around 20 grand even if it's a couple years old, I'm perfectly okay with that. I mean, the Tesla we have right now is a 2021. It is now just two years old. In fact, um, this past week, it would have passed its two-year uh, mark since we bought it. So that's not bad. I would easily pay $20,000 for the car we've got in our driveway. So this is awesome news. But I'm actually going to take the opportunity to plug a local business right here in Richmond, Virginia. They just had their grand opening this past week, Recharged. They are a dedicated EV used car lot. So full battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. And if you combine that with the information you got from Tenant and Alex last episode, now you've got the best financing options for used electric vehicles. You're going to get one from a reliable, knowledgeable source of professionals. You can get it right here in Richmond, Virginia. I know they will work with people that are out of state. And then once you've got it, get your battery health report monthly from Recurrent, and now you're going to be in a really, really great position. So I honestly, if you are in the market for a used Model 3, Recharged has a bunch of them on their lot. You can go to recharged.com and check it out. All right, well, that may be it for the news this week, but I've got a lot more coming up for you right after this. Hello, friends and EV enthusiasts. Did you know the best electric vehicle event is almost upon us? Join EV Resource and Drive Electric RVA at Dominion Raceway in the heart of Virginia on Saturday, October 7th for the 2023 Electric Vehicle Festival. Mingle with fellow EV owners and enthusiasts, connect with industry experts, and feel the thrill of driving your EV on a two-mile racetrack or drag strip. Not an EV owner yet? You can get all of your questions answered in the EV Education Zone, take a ride in the Arkimoto FUV around the NASCAR Oval, or hop in with one of our EV owners and take a ride around the track. So what are you waiting for? Grab your tickets right now on Eventbrite and come celebrate the excitement of electric vehicles with us October 7th for the East Coast's must-attend EV event. All right, welcome back. It is now time for the question of the week. Each week, I ask you a question and post it to the EV Resource Patreon page. Last week, I had asked you all to tell me a little bit about yourselves and share something that you'd want me to know just to get to know you a little bit better. And I have to admit, when I originally chose that, I was planning on sharing the answers like I always do. But as I'm sitting here right now, I don't really feel comfortable doing that. So I'm just going to skip past the answers. There were a couple that were there and they are on the Patreon page. You can go and see should you want to get to know some of the other people that listen to the podcast as well. But I'm just going to skip past that and then get to the question for this week. So this week's question is this. Who is someone that you would like me to have as a guest on a future podcast episode? It can be a person or even a company. So as usual, I have this posted to the EV Resource Patreon page and made it public so you do not have to be a current Patreon supporter in order to participate. And if there's somebody or a company that you would like to hear on the podcast in the future, let me know. Before I get to the ending announcements, I want to talk about the Electric Vehicle Festival a bit more. 
Now in its third year, the EV Fest is a celebration of the fun and excitement of electric vehicles. I started this back in 2021 after a friend and I had the idea to build an event that would combine the joy of electric vehicles with a racetrack. Well, it's grown, and this year we have an EV education zone where the EV curious and new owners can get answers to their questions from a number of industry experts and EV owners. We have Arkhamoto in official capacity this year, and they'll be giving rides in the FUV. And then also a number of EV owner volunteers will be giving rides to attendees around the two-mile road course and drag strip. And something new for this year, I've changed the marketing, so I've got a little announcement about that. As you may or may not know, I completely changed up the marketing strategy. Instead of spending our money on Facebook ads and YouTube ads and the traditional media, I want to give money back to you. So we do have a referral program for the ticketing where buy a general admission ticket, I'm going to send you a link that you can use to refer your friends to purchase their tickets through. When there are three tickets that are purchased through your link, your ticket is now going to be actually free. And at the point where you have 10, now I'm going to give you an all day track pass so you can get out on the track and have some fun but right now i want to make a special announcement for the winner the person who by the day before the event has the most amount of referrals through their link i'm going to give you something extra special let me show you what it is we are giving away a brand new in the box never been opened xbox series s with a 512 gigabyte solid state drive this is capable of gaming up to 120 frames per second this is state of the art this will be perfect for either you or a gift for the gamer in your life. I'm so excited that we're giving this away. So there you go. That's our way of sweetening the deal we want to give to you. So free tickets, free track time, free Xbox Series S. What else could you ask for? I'm so excited about the event this year, and I can't wait to see you there. So tickets are on sale now at Eventbrite. You can look for the Electric Vehicle Festival in Virginia, and it's very easy to find. Actually, it should be the only thing or the first thing anyway that pops up. All right. So now I want to thank our supporters for the podcast through Patreon. At the director tier, we have leading the way Rajiv Narayan and Andy Cooper. And at the executive producer tier, Christopher Lawrence. So thank you, gentlemen, for your support. It really does mean a lot and makes a big difference in what I'm able to do with my time as well as software and other things for the podcast. If you don't feel quite up to making a contribution on Patreon, I do have a few other ways that the podcast is supported. Instead of mandatory paywalls or membership fees, things like that, I use affiliate connections and advertising partners to keep the EV Resource podcast free. So I do have a full listing of everybody on the EV Resource webpage. It's at ev-resource.com slash deals. I invite your feedback via email to hello at ev-resource.com. And that will be it for this podcast. So thank you so much for listening and have an electrifying day.